All right, everyone, we're going to go ahead and pick up where we left off with our last recording. Uh, I know that we had some errors on that video just in terms of the end recording. So we're going to pick up with pathophysiology of ARDS. Now, we've talked briefly about the different you know, conditions that we've had. We've talked about emphysema, we've talked about chronic bronchitis and so on, and how they fall into the realm of COPD. Uh, but what we also need to understand is acute respiratory failure and kind of the processes of acute respiratory failure. And this picture does a really, really good job of kind of outlining the steps that have to occur for ARDS to truly take place and for that respiratory failure to, or respiratory distress essentially to occur. So as you can see here, we have two halves. We have our normal half over here working great. We got our red blood cells and then over, you know, getting oxygenated on the right side. We have our, our antigens. We've got macrophages, neutrophils, etc., And we have an inflamed lining here in the alveoli. Additionally, we can also see if we look upward here, we can see edema fluid. And that's what all that is. That's the fluid that becomes uh, in or comes into the alveolus. And it actually impedes, impairs ability of CO2 and O2 exchange. Um, not only that, if you look to here at the cells lining the alveoli, you'll see that, that they've either died, they're missing, or they're currently necrotic. Okay, so essentially we've agitated this alveolus, we've agitated the lining, we've agitated these cells, and in response we get this acute swelling. Okay, and remember this can be from a multitude of issues, um, but essentially we have three stages that are going to occur. We have the exudative, the proliferative, and fibrotic stages of ARDS. In that first stage, we're releasing those inflammatory markers, bradykinin, cytokines, and uh, prostaglandins that are pulling swelling to the area and actually putting uh, edematous fluids into the tissue. Okay. After that, because of the swelling and the inflammation, the lungs kind of become stiff so that alveolus doesn't expand anywhere near the way it should, so we don't get that nice ballooning and then recoil that we should get uh, from a healthy alveolus. Okay. Well, then on top of it, we have increased dead space because of the decreased compliance, so we, we have an increased degree of air that is never exposed to the CO2-O2 exchange process from the capillary bed surrounding the alveolus, and that's that dead air we're we've talked about previously. Uh, we also have decreased surfactant. Okay, remember that's what keeps the alveolus and the cells there, the cili healthy. Uh, VQ of mismatching and capillary leaking. Okay, what is happening is not only can you leak fluid outside the capillary surrounding the alveolus out toward the tissue itself, but you can leak fluid from the actual capillary bed into the alveolus, and that's where we get a lot of this edematous tissue. When that happens, you actually begin to drown uh, because you have fluid in the lower portions of your alveolus, so you can't exchange properly. Okay, here's a perfect example, and you might hear this term. Uh, this is a nice, nice X-ray of a whiteout. In fact, it's a little bit too nice almost. Uh, but you can see, this is all, all that whiteout where the lungs should be. This is all fluid. It's all fluid or fibrous tissues. Okay, and that's what it would look like on a chest X-ray. Whereas on a regular chest X-ray, these would be just kind of black, maybe dark grayish areas that would, for the most part, be translucent. And that is not the case here. So, how are we going to manage these patients with ALI and ARDS? Okay, we're going to look for manifestations. Obviously, I, I have my very basic difficulty of breathing, deoxygenation, look at my SpO2, I'm looking for tachycardia, tachypnea, signs of, of uh, compensation. We talked about shock. Uh, this, this can definitely, you know, we've talked about respiratory arrest leads directly to what? And that is cardiac arrest. And we go through the shock process as we begin to lose our ability to breathe and exchange gases and oxygenate. Okay. Um, for me in the hospital, I'm definitely looking for clinical. We just talked about that, but we're looking at our ABGs too. That pH, that PaO2, that PaCO2, and the bicarb, all four components. There are other additional components, but those are my four focal components. Getting that chest x-ray to get a visualization of what's occurring there in the chest. Uh, and we're also going to go ahead and do pulmonary measurements. Not you, uh, but the radiologist will do pulmonary measurements. Okay. At the end of the day, all we're trying to do is repair that process of oxygenation and ventilation. Um, we're getting air in and out of the lungs, but we're not getting it exposed to alveolus that can exchange the CO2 and O2 across the membrane. That's the key with ARDS. I'm not getting oxygen into the body and CO2 out of the body properly. Okay. Therefore, my tissues never get the respiration and never get the oxygenation they need. And therefore, my mitochondria, you know, we've talked about ATP, three components, glucose, oxygen, and water. Well, if I have decreased oxygenation, I step from a realm of aerobic metabolism inside the mitochondria of the cell to an area of anaerobic metabolism uh, inside the mitochondria, which is a far more inefficient process and creates far more waste inside the body. 
So you got to get ahead of it and you got to get really aggressive with this particular issue. Otherwise, it will devolve into respiratory failure. All right. So uh, mechanical ventilation, and we've talked a lot about mechanical ventilation with COPD patients, and we know for a fact it's the last step. Like the last thing you want to possibly do is stick a COPD patient on a vent. And that is true. Okay, because once you stick somebody that already operates at a respiratory deficit onto a ventilator, it becomes incredibly challenging to get them off that ventilator. Okay, um, with ALI and ARDS patients, it is possible you may have no other choice to to have a patient on a vent. Okay, and it may be for aspiration protection. It may be their ALOC and they're going to aspirate. They can't swallow. They can't protect their airway. Uh, it may be that. Oh, excuse me. They don't have enough pressure coming into the alveolus to force uh, that fluid or edema out of the alveolus and back into circulation. And while CPAP slash BiPAP has viability in this realm and that we can control the PEEP to some extent, uh, it's not always going to do everything we need it to do. So we will have to ventilate you at some point. Uh, inverse IE ratios or possibilities increase the pressure, the PEEP, pr uh, the, the, the pr and expiratory pressure going into the lungs so we can get fluid out. Um, we're going to be doing all sorts of stuff. Um, there's some old rules uh, that nitric oxide inhaled helped with ARDS, and they have long since disproved that fact. I won't ask you anything about it. Just be aware it's super old school. Haven't even heard of this particular like thing in a long time, but it is a thing nonetheless. Uh, sedation with ventilation and neuromuscular blockades. When we have that really stiff lung compliance, and here's an issue, and I've talked about it briefly with the mechanical ventilation and the fact that you can actually have too much pressure going into the lungs. Okay, So if we have a pressure and going into the lungs, we look at the PEEP and we look at inspiratory pressure, especially if our patient's on a pressure control setting. Okay, I gave you those five settings we need to know. AC has four settings we need to know. Pressure control had five. Uh, so when I look at my overall pressure, we're going to combine the PEEP and the inspiratory pressure to come up with a total number. For example, an inspiratory pressure might be 28 and the PEEP might be 5, okay, giving me a total inspiratory pressure of 33. 33 is what we are pushing into the lungs to force the alveolus open and to force fluid back out of the lung. However, I mentioned it earlier with ARDS, we have decreased lung compliance and stiffness. Okay, There is a very fine balancing act that a pulmonologist has to, to enact sometimes with more severe ARDS and ALI cases, and that's that they have to walk the tightrope between giving you enough pressure to re-expand the alveolus, to push those fluids out of the alveolus, but not so much pressure that the stiffness of the lung becomes an issue and you rupture or tear a lung and end up with a pneumothorax, or worse yet, hemothorax in some severe cases. So something to consider. The reason I mention this is because, oh, excuse me, whenever you have a patient that is on a ventilator, we're going to go ahead and sedate them. And our three main sedative drugs uh, for management on a ventilator are Versed, Fentanyl, and Propofol. Preferably, if, if you don't have to use Versed, we'd, we'd use that dead last, using Fentanyl and Propofol first. Propofol is your hypnotic, Fentanyl is your pain management slash analgesic, and Versed is a benzodiazepine that also is a hypnotic as well, a sedative hypnotic. Okay, but we want to use Versed dead last and only in instances where we absolutely have to get you more sedated than Propofol offers us, or maybe your blood pressure is too low and Propofol is too too aggressive with that, lowering that pressure even further. Yeah, in that case, we may see Versed over Propofol, but uh, Versed in long-term use is contraindicated and not a great choice. So... Alternately, uh, you may see down here the neuromuscular blockade in very, very specific cases where a patient is non-compliant with the ventilator because they're so stiff, the muscles won't relax, they are tense, and the lung tissues are non-compliant. What you may see is a start them on a rocuronium or vecuronium drip, a continuous drip, to keep them paralyzed throughout the entire process of ventilation. And we do this for periods at a time, and especially with COVID, uh, we did this for weeks, months at a time. And the problem with neuromuscular blockades in the long term is it can actually damage distal neurons and affect and impair uh, sensation and sensory neurons in the periphery. So something to keep in the back of your mind. Great tool uh, if you really need to get the patient's body fully relaxed. Excellent tool because they're already sedated. We know where they're managed that way. So we're going to paralyze them now. One thing you must know and never do, and I shouldn't even have to say this, never paralyze a patient that is not sedated or on a ventilator, okay? Because they're going to stop breathing on you right there and right there, 
So essentially the neuromuscular blockade uh, makes them fully reliant on the ventilator and relaxes the entirety of their body and therefore it requires less pressure on our end to be forced into the patient uh, resulting in decreased risk of a, um, a bariatric or excuse me bariatric a barometric event where we we rupture any alveolus or have a pressure issue. Sometimes by the way we do prone patients while they're ventilated. Uh, we did it a ton with COVID and we saw some good success with it. Um, However, it can be a little more challenging with bigger patients, especially patients that have large abdominal structures or thoracic structures because it does push up on the diaphragm and crush the lungs. These patients cannot just lay flat prone perfectly. The head of bed does need to be elevated approximately 15 to 25 degrees. Um, but no, we've seen incredible success with this position as well. Moving forward. Uh, the most common causes of ALI and ARDS, hands down, and early detection helps you here, is infection, sepsis, uh, dysrhythmias. That can be one of the more uh, respiratory-associated complications as the respiratory gets worse. Left ventricular dysfunction, acid base imbalances, thromboembolisms, or embolus in the in the lungs or pulmonary structures. Uh, GI bleeds, complication of ventilation. So there's a lot of stuff that can occur. Okay. Um, with ventilatory issues. We already talked about like pneumothorax, but also you have to consider they are ventilated, but it's not a, it's not, it doesn't mean they can't aspirate. So if you have a patient, this is where, you know, your sedation really comes into play. If you have a patient, you need to make sure they're adequately sedated. The patient must be adequately sedated, not fighting and bucking and gagging on the vent. If they're gagging on that endotracheal tube and they start having gastric contents coming up their airway, not only will it come out their mouth, it has a high risk and a high chance of, of moving past the cuff and the trachea as they thrash around and moving stomach acid, bile, or whatever contents are coming up into the airway. And that's a big deal. That's a big problem. Aspiration pneumonia by itself is a terrible thing. And then on top of it, to have food or anything else into the airway adds, adds risk. Uh, for complications with ARDS and further sev se like becomes more severe. But also now I have to do procedures like bronchoscopies just to clean the airway potentially again of mucus or any other obstructions. So uh, evaluate response to therapy. Is what you're doing working? Well, how would I know if a patient's on a ventilator? How would I know it's working? And some of your more obvious answers are, oh, look at the monitor, look at my SpO2. Sure. Look at your tachycardia. Okay. Are they still tachycardic? Because if they are, the chances are they're hypoxic still. Or they have other issues. Maybe they're febrile. Okay. Um, other means of assessing whether or not this is working. And then probably the two gold standards are your chest x-ray and your ABGs. So we're looking especially at that CO2, O2, or PaO2, PaCO2 balance in my blood gas. And I'm looking to see uh, kind of what that looks like. So just food for thought here. Okay, some other things to consider is a strict fluid balance or strict I's and O's or intake and output. And the reason I say strict fluid balance is more specifically because um, we have a patient that may already be fluid overloaded they or ne necessarily overloaded, but their vasculature is not containing their fluid properly. And that's a problem. Okay, so the fluid belongs inside the vasculature. It doesn't belong in the alveolus. It doesn't belong in the third spaces of the body. And when that occurs, I don't want to add more fluid. So until I can get that fluid displaced back into or from the third space, from the alveolus and back into vasculature, we're going to be very careful about how much fluid we add to the patient. Okay. And remember, for those of you that are looking at these ARDS patients, do me a favor and go ahead and look at their albumin levels as well, especially if you think their ARDS slash ALI is related to a septic infection or a bacterial infection or pneumonia of the lungs. So... Antibiotics prevent further infection or community-acquired or aspiration-acquired pneumonia. Hydrocortisone to decrease swelling and inflammation, 200 milligrams TID. Uh, we're going to increase all the way, just 200 for four days, and then we're going to decrease down over the next seven. <laughs> Goal is to get you off the ventilator and ready to go home by the 10th day. Now, I have to admit, with most cases of ALI slash ARDS, we are able to get these patients out the door within about a week or two, okay? Even if they're vented, usually two to three days on the vent does the trick. That being said, we kind of saw an exception to this with COVID. COVID was unique in that we could never get ahead of the swelling and inflammation process. 
we could never get far enough ahead to stop the cytokine storm with those particular patients. And the cytokines would brought that inflammation, that swelling and stiffness to the, to the lung structures and the alveolus specifically. So we ended up leaving them on these ventilators for months, two months before they would expire. And we never would win that battle and they would go into respiratory failure permanently. Surgical approaches to pulmonary disorders. We'll briefly just talk about this. Okay, anytime you're going to have a surgery or we're going to be doing a pulmonary surgery, we're going to be doing pulmonary status, okay? How much tissue is available? How, how lung compliance is, you know, lung, lung efficiency? We're going to be doing cardiovascular status. Are you healthy cardiac-wise? Heart rate, blood pressure, EF. So we're going to be doing an echo. Nutritional status, comorbidities, any additional issues that we might have to consider during that surgery, and anxiety level going in. Okay, I'm not going to ask you to know too much about this, but I do want you to be aware of the different surgical procedures as it relates to pulmonology and some of these, these disease processes. We can do thoracotomies where we open up the chest. Okay, we do open biopsies. Uh, we resection surgical portions of the lung. We have wedge resections, segmental resections, lobectomies. Okay, especially if we have a necrotic portion of the lung or an affected portion that is so severely damaged it is beyond repair, we will definitely look at and examine a lobectomy. But these are, are surgeries that remove a portion of the lung that is affected by typically a septic infection or is so necrotic due to impaired blood flow. Maybe a pulmonary embolus occurred, took out a whole lobe of the lung. We'll remove the whole lobe before it becomes necrotic and, and, and gangrenous or continues to break down inside the body. There is such thing as a pneumonectomy in cancer cases where we remove the entire lung. And then we have our VATS procedure. The thoracostomy, and this is the one you should put a star next to because it's something you should remember, we do a lot of these, is, is chest tube insertions, and it's called a thoracostomy. With pneumonectomies, very special considerations here. Remember, we're removing an entire lung, but you need to really consider some of the physiological changes that are going to take place because you're removing an entire lung, and you're not just removing the pressure that that lung supplies to whatever side of the chest. You know, you're also changing all your fluid and shifting all the fluid that would typically be in the pulmonary artery and pulmonary veins coming from that lung. You're shifting it back into the rest of circulation and going to a singular lung. So something you want to consider, positioning, put these patients upright, okay? They will not do laying well laying flat. They are not going to get uh, chest tubes, not going to get any of that. No, nothing. That's it. No chest tubes. They're just the lung is out, clip, 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 cotter, cotter, cotter. No chest tubes, monitor for bleeding. Uh, and bleeding wouldn't show like on external signs. You wouldn't see on the outside of the body, uh, but you would see it in the form of tachycardia, initial rise in blood pressure and heart rate, kind of like a normal patient that goes into hemorrhagic shock in that early stage of compensated shock. Chest tubes. Now let's talk about this. We definitely need to talk about chest tubes and the placement. Placement is by pulmonologist or um, ER docs can do them. And occasionally you'll find um, anesthesiologists will do them as well. But your job is to manage them once they're placed. And that's to make sure all the connections are intact. The suction is working. We're going to be looking at the fluctuation. Okay, big thing. The fluctuation uh, occurring in... Sorry, my headset shut itself off there. The fluctuation occurring inside the actual suction canister. We're looking for we're you're looking for any bubbling, air leaks. We're looking for all that. Make sure your suction's working, and then we're looking for drainage coming out of the chest tubes as well. Okay. If you have a problem with the chest tube, we went over it briefly in lab. We're gonna go ahead and follow it away from the patient to the wall. Um, is one of my favorite things to do. Now, if you suspect that it's something else, like one of your devices controlling the suction unit itself, work your way from the wall to the patient. Either way, as you work, in, and again, you can work from the patient to the wall or wall to the patient. I prefer wall to the patient just because I go to the wall. Is it working? Yes. Okay. Next. Is my valve working? Yes. Okay. Next. Is my regulator working? Yes. Okay. Cool. Canister intact. Cylinder intact. And I work my way down all the way to the unit. And if the suction at the unit is still working, then my problem lies somewhere between the unit and the patient. And typically, it's an incomplete seal on the patient's chest, as I found my most common culprit. So, stuff to consider. You can see your little chest tube over here. You're going to be doing chest x-rays to confirm placement. Absolutely. Okay. Now, this is old chest tube management. We do not do suction control chamber, water seal chamber, and drainage collection any longer. But this is how it used to look. 
you'd have three chambers sitting on the ground like this with tubes going in and out of them and a divider in the middle. And this is how it looked and worked. It was kind of a cool process. Uh, you'd have your drainage collection coming from the patient. Boom, into the tube. Okay. We're going to go back over. We go to the water seal. Tube all the way into the water. Sucks air in and back out. Suction control chamber was the... So your suction was... This is the wall. This was the patient. We don't do this anymore. Long since gone. We do use devices like this one right here. And this is the atrium collection or drainage collection um, uh, setup. It's slash system. It's real simple. Look over here. Here's where our water seal chamber is. We're going to fill that. Usually this fill spout is right up here. We're going to fill that. Okay, got it. We're going to go ahead and look at our suction control over here. And then usually they'll have, and this one's a little bit different, but this one doesn't have the little marker on the front where you adjust the dial. You actually have to control on this one. You're going to have to control how much pressure you have coming into the patient, either with a dial off to the side or the front, or on the wall itself. And these would measure 10, 20, 30, 40, 40 being the max. B is the chamber that has the little bubble or valve that's going to come up, indicating suction is being applied. But we're looking at all these components, and then this is our actual collection tubing side. And by the way, once these are full, we're not draining these out. We're getting a brand new one and sticking it in line. It's that simple. Post-op nursing care. We're watching for secretions, watching for ineffective cough, impaired gas exchange, bleeding, fluid overload. Anything that indicates hypoxia, uh, ineffective slash impaired breathing patterns, pain, anxiety, fear, looking for all of it. And there's a lot going on here. So, stuff to think about. Let's talk about DVTs. Okay. Uh, roughly 250,000 cases a year. It's actually up to 310 now. Uh, either way, it's elusive as all hell. And the reason being is because usually you don't know you have them until it's a little bit too late. Okay. There is a, what's called a Virchow's triad. This kind of talks about uh, people who are at highest risk for DVT development. And the three, three components of Virchow's triad, wink, wink, you should know this, are vascular injury, vanostasis, and hypercoagulability. Okay. These are the people that are at highest risk of developing clots, DVTs, and having issues uh, like a DVT. So... Other risk factors, active, uh, I'm not going to read through them actually, <laughs> it's a long list, but active risk factors or other risk factors for development of DVT, it's a long list. But all of them are good indicators, especially that obesity one. All these are really good indicators that this could be an issue for the patient. Let's move you out of the way. Oh, I did not mean to do that, my apologies. So let's talk about DVT. Let's talk about the risk stratification. Okay, uh, We used to do this all the time. Uh, ever since we switched over to Epic at St. Mary's, we haven't been doing it at all. But we look at, and we have some, some risk factors that we examine when a patient is admitted. Uh, we look at their age. We look at treatment, ambulation, um, prophylaxis. And we, whenever I hear the word DVT, whenever you hear the word DVT prophylaxis, uh, the first thing that's coming to your mind uh, should be the combination of either Lovenox, Heparin, um, uh, Ted Hose, uh, early ambulation, mechanical prophylaxis could be the uh, compression devices on the end of the beds. All those are examples that are really important to get ahead of and get on your patients. Uh, moderate risk, okay, we're above 40 years of age now, minor surgeries with some risk factors. Uh, we're definitely going to be giving them low molecular weight heparin, uh, unfractionated heparin, mechanical prophylaxis. And then we look at high, 60 and older, history of surgery, same as moderate, same things. Okay, but we're trying to get these patients up and out of bed as quick as possible. Uh, lastly, and here's the big one. Okay, and these are the people that have very high risk of development of DVT. Greater than 40 years of age with multiple risk factors, hip or knee surgery interventions, major trauma, spinal cord injuries. I'm completely screwed apparently. And then we're going to treat them the same way. Low molecular weight heparin, anti-factor XA is kind of extreme. It literally makes it to where they can't use XA factor to help them clot, but it's called delta parin. We would not automatically do this, but it's something we would consider in cases with someone with a history of DVT especially. And then mechanical prophylaxis. So I don't need you to memorize them, just want you to be aware of kind of how we gauge things in the hospital. So I see what they did here, and this isn't the greatest representation. Yeah, this isn't the greatest. So what they're trying to show you is ST depression here. 
and you're not, it, it, you can see that T wave inversion. Okay, you see the T wave inversion on a couple of these prominent S wave, but also you see that ST depression as well. Um, so we have a couple issues that are going on here. I don't expect you to know stuff like this. Can this indicate it? Yes. Is it a concrete indicator, diagnostic? No. But it is a contributing diagnostic. So I won't ask you to know the waveforms on an EKG of a T wave inversion slash prominent S wave. Uh, pulmonary embolisms. So what are we going to do if you have one? Optima we're going to do optimal, optimal oxygenation ventilation. Uh, we're going to get them heparin. They're probably going to be on a heparin drip. Okay, uh, we're going to be examining PT, PTT, and INR consistently, usually every two to six hours until we are in a target range for those values, and then once every 24 hours after that. If you have DVTs in the lower extremities that are high risk or consideration high risk, uh, we're going to put a what's so called an IVC filter in the 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 distal vena cava, and that what that does is if the the DVT breaks loose and becomes an embolus and starts moving, the IVC filter would catch it in the ascending vena cava or inferior vena cava as it returns to the heart, so it stops it from re reaching the heart and circulating. Uh, we have thrombolysis, uh, which can take the form of TPA, tissue plasminogen activator, or TNK, uh, administration through IV. And then we have embolectomies. And embolectomies are where we typically go in through the affected vessel, go into it, and actually find the clot, and then pull it out of the body or suck it out of the body. Um, and, and that's actually a full procedure typically done in the cath lab by interventional radiology. So really cool options here. The problem is if you have what's called a saddle PE or a massive pulmonary embolism that clots off a pulmonary artery while you're just walking around, there's really not much we can do and there's really limited terms of treatment that we can conduct uh, to even save this patient. For many of the large pulmonary embolisms that occur in patients, you can even have them open on a surgical table, chest open and everything, ready for surgery, ready for pulmonectomies, whatever, and it still wouldn't be enough in time to save that patient. Because when you occlude a pulmonary artery or pulmonary vein, uh, and by the way, it's almost always a pulmonary artery, whenever you occlude a pulmonary artery, you stop the blood flow coming from the heart to the lungs through that vessel entirely, and the backup is instantaneous. The right-sided heart failure, instantaneous. Stress on the heart, instantaneous. Lack of oxygenation, instantaneous. Hypoxia, instantaneous. You have a matter of 30 seconds to 60 seconds to really reverse a massive pulmonary embolism. You don't have long. In smaller cases where we have partial occlusions or occlusions to smaller vessels, we can definitely treat those and we can take care of things there. I do occasionally get asked some of the differences between low molecular weight heparin and uh, unfractionated heparin, and that's fine. Uh, but what you need to know, is, and I like how it says unknown, that cracks me up to no end. But what you need to know is that each each heparin, uh, and they're both heparins the, at, the, at their core, but we, they bind differently and they act differently. Okay, no, I won't ask you to know these, but what you do need to know is low molecular weight heparin that comes in the little pre-filled syringes is fantastic for, for prophylaxis purposes. Unfractionated heparin is far more potent, far more powerful, and we use unfractionated heparin typically in patients with active pulmonary embolus or emboli or uh, you know any kind of clot active in the body where I need to thin the blood out and I need to get the clotting components of the blood to decrease in efficiency and capacity. So that's all I'm going to leave you with there. I won't ask you to know the slide in depth, but just know unfractionated heparin is the more powerful of the two. All right, so these are some resources if you'd like to go check them out. That is the end of this particular lecture. We're going to go ahead and end right there. Uh, I will add this one onto the first video and upload it, and we will we'll talk to you in class. You guys take care and bye.